The Chinese word for crisis is composed of two symbols, which roughly translated mean opportunity in a time of danger. Some scholars disagree and say this interpretation is a Western myth and that the symbols really mean precarious moment. Nevertheless, there is wisdom in recognizing difficult times as a chance to grow if the opportunity is taken. In this unit, we will be discussing family crises. Now, no family is immune from crisis. Crises have different sources, but in any case, they are loosely linked with stressful events. A family crisis occurs when a family has to change. It is a turning point. Things will either get better or they will get worse. Reuben Hill developed the ABCX family crisis model in trying to account for differential success in coping. In essence, A is the stressor event and the hardships it produces. B is the management of the stress through coping resources that the family has. Since an important aspect of the impact of stress is the way in which the stressful situation is defined, C refers to the family's definition of the event. A, B, and C interact to produce X, the crisis. McCubin and Patterson later proposed a double ABCX model in which they relabeled the A factor as family demands. There are three components to family demands, the stressor, the hardships that accompany the stressor, and the pileups or residuals of family tension. There are numerous commonplace tensions and strains in most of our lives. Another way to look at this model is through three temporal stages, pre-crisis, the crisis time, and post-crisis. Family adaptation depends on the use of adaptive resources and positive perspectives in the post-crisis phase. Crisis is sometimes the catalyst that pushes families to make positive changes and grow through a family crisis. Stressor events per se are not sufficient to cause serious problems. The context in which the event occurs, the way that the family defines the event, and the resources the family has for dealing with it are all crucial to the outcome. The kinds of things most likely to be important stressors vary somewhat over the family life cycle. During the early childbearing years, financial strains are the most common. Time demands are frequently the source of strain. There are different types of stressor events. The stressor may arise from within or outside the family. It can be expected or unpredictable, controllable or uncontrollable. Be familiar with the types of stressor events on page 288. Internal stressor events are those that begin from someone inside the family, such as getting drunk, suicide, or running for election. External stressor events begin from someone or something outside the family, such as earthquakes, terrorism, the inflation rate, or cultural attitudes towards women and uh, minorities. Normative events are expected over the family life cycle, such as birth, launching an adolescent, marriage, aging, or death. Non-normative events are unexpected, such as winning a lottery, getting a divorce, dying young, war, or being taken hostage. These are often but not always disastrous, and they can hit a family hard because you can't really mentally prepare yourself for these events. Continuing with the types of stressor events, ambiguous ones are where you can't get the facts surrounding the event. It's so unclear that you're not even sure that it's happening to you and your family. Uh, an example would be someone who is missing in action. Uh, this type of stressor also relates to ambiguous loss, such as caring for a family member with Alzheimer's disease. It is a difficult challenge to care for someone who is physically there, but not mentally. It can seem like uh, there's a stranger in the house. Non-ambiguous stressor events provide clear facts about the event, what is happening, when, how long, and to whom. Volitional events are wanted and sought out, such as freely choosing a, a job change, uh, or entering college, or uh, deciding to uh, have a pregnancy. Non-volitional events are not sought out, but just happen, such as being laid off or the sudden loss of someone loved. Finishing up our list of the types of stressor events, they can be chronic or acute. Chronic stressor events have a long duration, such as diabetes, chemical addiction, or racial discrimination. Acute events last a short time, but uh, they can be severe, such as uh, breaking a limb, losing a job, 
or flunking a test. Cumulative stressors are events that pile up one right after the other so that there's no resolution before the next one occurs, a dangerous situation in most cases. Isolated stressor events occur alone, at least with no other events apparent at that time, and uh, they can be pinpointed easily. Not all stressors are equal. In spite of varying reactions, when we look at how large numbers of people respond to stressors, we can rank order the varied stressors in terms of severity. The Family Inventory of Life Events and Changes file is one effort to identify the severity. The most severe stressors involve death, divorce, violence, and illness. The least severe are such things as the purchase of an automobile or other major item. Drug abuse, particularly the abuse of alcohol, which is a drug incidentally, ranks high on the list of family stressors. Prescription drug abuse, especially of opioid pain relievers, is a major problem today. Drug abuse is the improper use of alcohol and other drugs such that the consequences are detrimental to the user and the family. It is the abuse, not merely the use of alcohol, that creates problems. Alcohol abuse is more common among men than among women and among whites than among African Americans. Drug abuse seriously detracts from the quality of family life. In many families, particularly when the abuse is long-term, there are negative consequences whether or not the abuser is drinking. In addition, the spouses of, and children of the abusers may develop various physical and emotional problems. The spouse may have feelings of hatred, self-pity, avoidance of social contacts, and exhaustion. Very often, the spouse has to perform the roles of both parents. The children of alcoholics tend to describe their families as less cohesive and more conflict-ridden than do children from other families. When the children become adults, their past experience in an alcoholic home can continue to trouble them. Many adult children of alcoholics have problems with intimacy because of their previous experiences, which have taught them not to trust people. If abuse can lead to family problems, family problems can also lead to drug abuse. Moreover, drug abuse can take its toll across a number of generations. There is a plethora of negative consequences for children and families with alcoholics. They perceive less parental warmth and concern. Also, they experience a shortened childhood because of assuming early responsibility for their own and other family members' well-being. They may take over tasks such as cooking, cleaning, and shopping. Children and families with alcoholics display higher rates of hyperactivity. They have problems with schoolwork. They report higher rates of health problems and have higher rates of anxiety and depression. Next to death, separation, and divorce, family violence is the most difficult experience people have to cope with. If the bright side of intimate relationships is their potential for enhancing our well-being, the dark side is their potential for destruction because of physical and verbal abuse. If we define violence to include mild forms, such as spanking, the majority of parents use some form of violence against their children. A prototype of the abusive parent would be one who is single, is young, around 30 or less, has been married for fewer than 10 years, has had his or her first child before the age of 18, and is unemployed or employed part-time. Incest is a special form of child abuse and involves any type of exploitive sexual contact between relatives in which the victim is under 18 years of age. Overall, about one in seven Americans report that he or she was sexually abused as a child. Father-daughter incest is far more common than mother-son incest. The term spouse abuse is likely to conjure up the image of a man beating a woman. Abuse is more than physical and verbal abuse can be as damaging as physical abuse. Verbal aggression appears to be equally divided between men and women. Women may have values and attitudes that override the physical and emotional damage they are enduring. Although most of the attention has been focused on child and spouse abuse, researchers have discovered that children also abuse their parents. Abuse of elderly parents may also occur at the hands of their adult children. In the short term, abuse involves serious physical and emotional damage, but abuse also tends to have serious long-term consequences. Witnessing violence, as well as being victimized by it, has harmful consequences. Whatever the type of crisis faced, different families will have somewhat different reactions. 
One question that often comes up is, why do victims stay with the abuser? What is the difference between those who walk away from an abusive relationship at the first sign of trouble and those who cling to them? There may be no black and white answers, but here are some characteristics that seem to be common to those who can't just walk away. Low self-esteem. For whatever reason, those in abusive relationships usually have a very low opinion of themselves. They may think they are unattractive or too overweight or not smart enough. Consequently, they hold on to their present relationship because they believe that no one else would ever want them. They think it's the only relationship they will ever have. Abandonment issues. Perhaps they were abandoned by a parent in childhood and the loss was traumatic. They go through life trying to avoid feeling that way again. They hang on because being in an abusive relationship is better than being left alone. Because abandonment is their greatest fear. The need to be needed. They confuse pity with love. All of their relationships are with people who need them or are dependent on them in some way. They are rescuers. For example, they don't leave the relationship with an alcoholic because they think the alcoholic could not survive without their help. No boundaries. They have trouble setting personal boundaries, standing up for themselves. They have a problem saying no. They may try to set boundaries, but then feel guilty and allow those lines to be crossed, which usually causes more problems in the relationship than never having set the boundary in the first place. The column on the right relates to those in relationships with alcoholics. They may be addicted to excitement. Many who are involved in alcoholic relationships find that they are attracted to the excitement, the chaos, the uncertainty, and even the crises. They cannot stand to be bored. They would find normal people terribly dull. In times of relative calm, sometimes they will even create a crisis just to avoid boredom. For them, life must be a constant soap opera. Acceptance seeking. Since many who end up in alcoholic relationships grew up in alcoholic homes themselves, they are comfortable with alcoholics because they know they will not be judged. Having the approval of others is very important to them. Many are attracted to alcoholics in the first place because that is the behavior that they are used to and most comfortable being around. The martyr complex. These are those who seem to enjoy being in the role of a martyr, a perpetual victim for some psychological reason. They enjoy the sympathy they receive when they tell their friends the suffering they have to endure as a result of the alcoholic's behavior. And finally, hiding out. As long as they have the alcoholic's behavior to focus upon, it takes the spotlight off of their own shortcomings. If they can point the finger at the alcoholic and blame all of the family's problems on his or her behavior, no one notices the part they are playing. They are safe in the relationship because they can hide their own flaws behind the many mistakes of the alcoholic. Whatever a person does in the face of a crisis is a coping pattern. Even if a person does nothing, that is one way of trying to cope. There are ineffective coping patterns. Ineffective means that it is not a pattern that typically will yield a long-term constructive outcome. Denial is probably the most common of the ineffective coping patterns and is a defense mechanism in which people will not believe what they observe. Admitting the existence of a problem is not sufficient. Sometimes people acknowledge that the problem exists, but they avoid confronting and dealing with it. Avoidance can be used in any kind of crisis. Like denial, avoidance is not always a dysfunctional way of coping. Denial and avoidance can give your brain some time to process uh, the crisis. Sometimes people admit a problem but feel that they have to find someone or something to blame. They select a family scapegoat to bear the brunt of the responsibility for the problem. Scapegoating, unlike denial and avoidance, is not even useful in the short run. A family is most likely to cope effectively with problems or crises when the members have worked together to develop certain family strengths. The family that has developed strengths is likely to be a resilient family, one that can resist disruption in the face of change and cope effectively with crises. Lauer and Lauer present a graph in this chapter looking at the differing outcomes of a family crisis. One, higher maturity, the member has grown. Two, the same level as before, the member has coped adequately. And three, the lower level, the member has long-term negative reactions. There are different tools that people use in effective coping. 
In contrast to denial, avoidance, and scapegoating, effective coping begins when people take responsibility for themselves and their families. In a crisis, people may have to remind themselves that they and their families are also people with strengths and the capacity to cope effectively. People must affirm their own self-worth and their family's worth. People must balance self-concern with other concern. People must learn the art of reframing, which refers to redefining the meaning of something. It is a way of changing one's perspective on a situation. Family members must find and use available resources including all of the family's strengths previously discussed. Using available resources along with other coping strategies can enable families to emerge from a crisis at a higher level of functioning than it had before the crisis.